Good evening and welcome. Uh, we are very happy to see so many young faces tonight at our public panel discussion on a very topical and important topic which is not so easy to discuss um, all over the globe, I would say, not only in the Western Balkans, which we're going to focus a little bit upon, but not only. The topic today is new old extremism and nationalism in southeastern Europe, a threat to Europe and democracy. My name is Stefanie Fenkert, I'm the director of the International Institute for Peace, so the host here tonight, and I will be moderating. Um, Maybe just very briefly on the procedure, we don't want to have like super long statements and we would very much uh, like to engage you also to ask questions, so I will just have some questions in the beginning to our guests and then I will ask you to hop in. My colleague in the back is going to run around with the microphone, just point to me and, and I will take a look who, who wants to ask a question. Um, always important on, on these discussions is that we need to cooperate with each other, so I would very much like to thank uh, the Austria... Uh, the, the, um, it's called BBJ in German, which is the Bosnian Herzegovinian Austrian Youth. Um, and Dennis Miskic made the contact, so thank you so much. And also the ÖH from the Universität Wien and the Austrian Institute for International Politics, which should have been represented by Vedran Cihic, who unfortunately didn't make it tonight. But um, we are lucky still that Dennis Miskic was able to hop in, and I think uh, he's going to share also very important. Um, light on, on from a different perspective as a young person from the diaspora growing up and living in Austria. Um, I don't really want to take too much time, but I would like to introduce uh, my very distinguished guests, and I will start with Hikmet Karcic. Uh, to my right, he came from Sarajevo, from Bosnia Herzegovina, and he's a research associate at the Institute of the Research for Crimes Against Humanity and International Law. It's a very, very long title, but I hope I managed. And he has been extensively written on genocide, right-wing radicalism, radicalization. And I just would like to show maybe one book, which is the most recent one, which is called Torture, Humiliate, Kill, Inside the Bosnian Serb Camp System. Um, as far as I know, it's also an open access, and you can afterwards maybe approach him and ask him more about it later on. Um, next to him is Ingrid Steiner. She is a um, journalist and now correspond, correspond for Korea Austria, uh, dealing with foreign affairs. She just came back from Brussels, so she also has the big picture on what has been happening within the European Union. And before, in her long career already as a journalist, she used to live in the Western Balkans and she has been covering the region as well in the past, also after the worst, the wars. And, Dennis Miskic, uh, who has been very helpful in organizing this discussion, he also helped us in organizing a podcast, which I'm also now advertising, uh, which we published today, with Hikmet Karacic on similar topics and Julia Ebner. Please check it out on our website. And I look forward to have many interesting debates on the topics which are, as I mentioned in the beginning, not so easy. We're talking about genocide, we're talking about radicalization, what that means for democracy, what that means for the European Union. We all know we are going to have elections in the European Union upcoming next year, but also in Austria. And very unfortunately, radicalization is not only a topic for the Western Balkans, but also for the whole world. And we see that these very radical ideas have been mainstreamed uh, recently, maybe through to multiple crises which we are facing, be it climate change, be it the pandem pandemic, be it migration, and many other things which just are very, very easily used uh, to polarize, and politicians are using that uh, as well, um, is my opinion. But I would like to start with you, Hikmet, and um, please take your microphone. I would have like the very first question for you is uh, from your research. I mean, what is it about right-wing nationalism, radicalization from the region? We know about the wars, the ethnic wars also in the 90s, which led to mass atrocities, including a genocide in Srebrenica. But mass atrocities have been committed by all different ethnic groups in different scale all over the region. So why is it still so important? What does it mean for the today for the region? So how do you assess the situation in Southeastern Europe? Well, uh, firstly, to start off by thanking you for for hosting us and uh, you know making this space available for such an important topic. Uh, people who live in the, in the Balkans um, maybe view these things quite differently because we are living in, in the region, and uh, security is something which is the number one concern for young people who live there. 
um, you know, so so it's it's different looking for it from a, from a, from a, uh, from the U.S. or from Australia, just like we view differently the the events currently in Nagorno Karabakh or in Africa because it's far away. Um, when we talk about the region, we have to say that uh, the violence in the 90s was state-sponsored. So the Milosevic regime was the one which sponsored violence, from, which started off from Kosovo in the, light, in the late 80s up to uh, the wars in Croatia, uh, Slovenia, Croatia, and, and, and of course the longest and most brutal uh, aggression was on Bosnia and Herzegovina. So these uh, several wars which, which lasted for almost... Uh, nine to ten years basically left the whole area devastated to that extent that uh, it's very hard to regenerate uh, trust and and uh, and um, togetherness in a region which was so close to each other for almost 50 years. Uh, the most uh, maybe shocking thing when you when you research these topics is that uh, ethnicized violence and and nationalism very quickly can tear apart a society which is so intact. I think this is the, the number one uh, lesson you can learn from from research in genocide, and it is that even though you you have such a co cohesion cohesed society which is living very well together with a diverse uh, uh, um, uh, background and so on, it can break up very quickly and very easily. Uh, just to give you an example, in, in when when in, when Brazil a few years ago was electing. Um, a far-right nationalist leader, uh, a Brazilian journalist called me to, to talk about the, the troubles and the issues of, of far-right nationalism in, in societies. And when I explained to him the situation in the former Yugoslavia, he said, well, yes, you know, but uh, Brazil two years ago organized the, the World Cup, you know, so we are a bit different in Yugoslavia, you know, saying that, you know, we are much, you know, maybe like some tribe in the middle of uh, Europe. Well, I said, well, you know what? Sarajevo had the Sarajevo Olympics in 1984, and that didn't, that didn't really stop and uh, the siege of Sarajevo. And that's the, that's the thing which he which triggered him to realize how difficult uh, and and dangerous nationalism is. And uh, that's the one thing we always need to keep in mind. If if we live in a society where we think division isn't possible, that doesn't mean that a few bad apples in in, polit in politics, in academia, in media can entirely destroy a society. And that's the number one issue we always need to know. And that's something which, which the wars in the former Yugoslavia, and especially in Bosnia, as the most diverse Yugoslavia Republic, showed that uh, uh, nationalism can tear apart such a diverse society and keep it basically divided and polarized uh, 30 years after the war. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, after what you just heard, I mean, you're, you're a younger generation, you're only 21 years old. Um, you have been born, you're born in Austria, but you have um, Bosnia-Herzegovina and heritage as far as I know. How do you assess the situation like from this point of view, from an outsider who also has like some insights? I mean, I, uh, maybe you can also tell us that you have been working recently at the Srebrenica Memorial Center. How did this reshape your idea and maybe you can also compare the diaspora here because we know especially in Austria we do have like a huge diaspora not only from Bosnians but from from Serbs from Croats from Albanians like from the whole region do you have the feeling that you know those issues which Hikmet was just also mentioning that those things are also present here you know that it goes from a generation to another one and that you can still feel it also within diaspora or would you say it's just a very different thing and you cannot at all make conclusions or comparisons so Many questions. A, a very big question. I'll try to give like very brief answers. Uh, but growing up in, in Vienna and being born after the war, uh, I don't know anything else other than nationalistic politicians, uh, whether it's in, in Bosnia or, or, in, or in Serbia. You know? um, and it also reflects, I think, in the young people in the diaspora here. We have I mean, a very good sense to get... Uh, a very good way to get a sense of the whole picture is maybe, uh, you know, just as in, in Belgrade, the, foot, the football games. So if you have uh, football games uh, here in Austria or wherever, you will still have, you know, kids who, have, who don't really know what war means. They have no idea, you know, what it means to, to fight, fight in a war. Uh, go out on the street and uh, go on about their nationalist uh, chants. So... Um, I mean, this will tell you h how they feel. Uh, and also, a thing that I think is very 
is, is adding to that is that we don't learn anything about it here in school. So you either uh, don't hear about it at all, which was the case in my family, because uh, either the family is uh, too tra traumatized to say anything, uh, not enough time has passed to talk about it, um, or you get uh, nationalist narratives passed down to you, and if you don't have anything else you know, to, to, to check, uh, this is all you get. And uh, I see this uh, a lot in some of my peers, and uh, I'll, I'm happy to be proven otherwise, but I think you know, this is going to be very, da very dangerous too in the future if you know, in, in 15 or 20 years time these people are, go are going to be journalists or politicians or stakeholders in any other way dealing with the Western Balkans or wherever and have these you know, um, narratives passed down from their parents. But I'll stop here, maybe this is a good point for discussion later on. Thank you very much. Um Ingrid, if I may, um, you have, you're a journalist and um, you have a different point of view, maybe you can also see it like if we zoom out a little bit from the context of the European Union, you have been in Brussels for many years, we know that the Western Balkan region is uh, very close to the European Union, um, not all of them, I mean not Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina, but with the other ones we do have a candidate status, so we actually want to bring them closer, we want to bring them into the European Union. How do you assess the situation if you look at foreign policy in general, maybe f of the European Union, I'm also happy if you can make then the case later about uh, Austrian's foreign policy. When it comes to the region, how is it assessed uh, from this point of view? How do you see these narratives which you just heard uh, from diaspora, but also from within the region? Like how does this correspond with what actually is the ultimate goal, which is uh, obviously, and, and we are advertising for it and promoting uh, European Union integration for the Western Balkans for many, many years, and we see that the progress is not happening, but there is actually a backsliding, especially in specific countries, not in all of them of, mm. at the same time. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Just let me take a little bit different perspective. Because, um, as, as you said, Stephanie, I have been living in Brussels for the last six and a half years, and I was totally surprised how far away um, the Western Balkans are from, from Western Europe. They are felt like, I don't know, ages away. And, and the, the, the worst thing I, I thought to hear was when, when the Ukraine war started, then the whole Brussels said, wow, this is the first war after the Second World War. And I said, okay, Balkan Wars? <laughs> and they didn't even realize it had never arrived that this was a very, very, very bad war that was happening. So, so there is this Western part of Europe and the Western Balkans, yeah? Different story. And, and I think this is also the reason why the enlargement process is so slow, because uh, it was no necessity for, for the European Union. It was maybe Austria who said, okay, we have to take in the countries, but the big part, Germany, and especially France said, wait, 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 they are just making problems, they are poor, we don't want them in. Huh? It's just, okay, let them start their, their talks, but yeah, take their time. Huh? It's, only, it's really only after the, the Ukraine war, when they started to think it a bit different, they thought, okay, enlargement is probably a tool of geopolitics. And as there is this, this discussion, we have to take in Ukraine, we also have to take in the Western Balkans. And it's, it's now slowly, slowly progressing just to, to start this, this process. So. Thank you, Hikmet. Maybe if we get back to you and, and back also to the topic about uh, genocide, nationalism, radicalization. Um, what do you say, like, how important is the role of memory and also, you know, this issue of dealing with the past? We hear for so many years that it is very important that we need to deal with the past. If you have the examples of the big war in, 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 in Central Europe, I mean, the, the Second World War, you know, with um, France and, and Germany, like, kind of finding a way now to work together, being both within the European Union. But obviously, they have been forced because um, Germany lost the war. It was not the case for Serbia, in a sense. Milosevic stayed in power. So how do you assess, like, this situation in the, in the region when it comes to memory, dealing with the past? Like, what are the different narratives, and how is this also maybe portrayed in radicalization? 
Yeah, firstly to say that, uh, as you as you rightly noticed, um, the, the the perpetrators of mass violence and genocide were not militarily defeated in the Balkans. So uh, Yugoslavia continued to be a state uh, with Milosevic in power until 2000, um, and then Republika Srpska, the the, the Bosnian Serb entity, was basically um, given a status, a very good status in the Dayton Peace Accords in 1995. So what we actually had was an institutional um, uh, establishment of, of an entity which was based on mass violence. And so the biggest problem that, that, that uh, comes out of this is that many other countries after 1995, many other uh, extremists realized that you could commit mass violence and get away with it. You can, have, you, you can have your own small statelet if you commit genocide, if you commit mass violence and so on, depending on the current or at, at, the, at that moment present uh, geopolitical um, situation. So in 1985, uh, the world wanted to, to stop the war in Bosnia in any way possible. Uh, the Americans just wanted to, to not have dead children on, on CNN anymore. So they just said, let's stop it any way possible. And that's exactly what happened then instead of uh, stopping the war, what we have is uh, a frozen conflict. And, and, and the whole of Europe and even a lot of Bosnians naively believed that things were going to go on forward better and so on, but this was a small status quo, which lasted up to 2006, 2007, and then the new wave of uh, extremism and radicalization went, and now I get to the question of memory. Uh, after the war ended in 1986, the, the, the policies of the international community was that uh, memory of the war uh, shouldn't be in, in the public sphere and that all aspects of the war should be ignored or not being taught, uh, talked about in schools and so on. So what the, for example, the OSCE, what they did was they, they, they sent uh, people uh, to schools throughout Bosnia uh, and especially in, 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 in the Federation, with big black markers to erase things from textbooks so that children won't read about the war. So you had a, you had a case in 97 where you had OEC people going up from school to school erasing textbooks. Um, the, the issue of memory was, was, was denied, so today all the camps which I write about in my book don't have a single memorial uh, because they're all, they're all located in the Boston Serb Republic. So institutional memory, except for the Srebrenica Memorial, and this is due to the fact that the higher representative uh, um, international community, uh, maybe out of some um, guilt or, or whatever, uh, uh, pushed the idea of the memorial center, along again with the survivors of Srebrenica and the mothers of Srebrenica. That's the only institution that we have which is memory-based in Bosnia. All the other towns, which I mentioned in my book, Priador, Focha, Visegrad, Bielna, Zvornik. There's no trace that any uh, that any that any uh, crimes were committed there. Uh, even some of the, for example, the rape motel in in Visegrad, Vilna Vlas, where almost 200 uh, Bosniak women and girls were, were were detained. That is that is on TripAdvisor, so you can go and book a book a room if, in that hotel if you want. So, so that's the so what we have there uh, in, in in that part of, of the country is not only a denial of crimes but a glorification of crimes. So people who are perpetrators have their murals on the walls. The recent example which I was reading about this morning is that one of the uh, terrorists who attacked uh, Kosovo two weeks ago got a mural in Bielna, in Bosnia, in front of the school the primary school in Bielna. And the worst part is that this has been normalized. So, so in the news, when I read it, this, this was just an information, you know, there's a mural of this, uh, you know, Serbian hero portrayed on the walls of the primary school, Sveti Savo in Bielna, and that's it. No reaction, no critical uh, 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 opinion about this, no reaction from the international community, from even from the Bosnians, because the Bosnians got accustomed to these kind of things. So this is the, the, the biggest thing I'm afraid of, and that is the normalization of far-right fascism and extremism, which we've been accustomed to, unfortunately. When you, become, when you are, uh, uh, to that extent, uh, exposed to this kind of nationalism, you, you stop reacting to it. And, and this is the worst part, because from ignoring to, to accepting it, that's a big step backwards. 
And that's a step which, which, which is really hard to move on forward uh, afterwards. But may, may I ask you something? Um, I, I remember Priyadora, which was a really, really, really bad place, and a, a prison camp and torture camp and so on. Um, uh, is it, has it been ethnically cleansed? Are there, who is living there now? Are there Serbs living there? Or, or is this a mixed society? Or? Uh, in, in the whole of the Bosnian Serb Republic, the number of non-Serbs living there is under 5%. So in Prijedor, before, in 1991, you had a population of around 100,000. 65% were, were Bosniak Muslims. Uh, and Prijedor is probably the, the best returnee successful story. Kozarac, most, most specifically. Uh, but these are all old people. Young people are, are coming there over the, the, the summers. The rest are living in Austria, Germany, Sweden, and so on. They have rebuilt their houses, but these are um, just like after the Lebanese war. You have these the diaspora building huge houses, thinking they'll one day come back, but they never come, never come back. They come back in coffins to be buried. So, so uh, majority, ninety-five percent Serbs living in Republika Srpska today. Can you maybe, um, if we? Talk also a little bit about identities. I would like to stay with you, like a um, very little bit. Um, how how does it function? You know, like how can you link so much uh, like identity issues to like what happened to the past? What happened to uh, like be it like you know like a bad experience in the sense of oh we have been you know like the victimization. I mean we have been part of the group who has been. Um, perpetrated in a very, very serious way on the one hand, and on the other hand, you already described you know, the heroization of it, but all, all of these things, in, in my point of view, are kind of linked to identity. So, so what role does identity play in, the, in this sense? And do you actually think there is a way uh, to get out of this spiral of um, going backwards mm. in this sense? Yeah, the issue of identity, and this was an identity-based violence, so... so um, the most important thing people realized in 1982 was that uh, it didn't matter what you described yourself as. So it didn't matter what, what you considered yourself, what your identity was. Rather, the perpetrator was the one who identified you. Just like in the Holocaust, even if you, had, you, know, if you, if you weren't a practicing Jew or, or if you didn't even know Yiddish and so on, you were still targeted. Many people in Priyadur weren't you know, practicing Muslims. They didn't work describing themselves as Yugoslav and so on. Nevertheless, um, they, were, they were targeted for, for, uh, by, by the perpetrators uh, as, as Bosniak Muslims and, and confined in, in, in detention camps. So the, the, the concept of identity was very present uh, for, for, for the perpetrators, but also the, victim, the victims. I mean, the, the Bosniaks is the primary victim group. They're the ones whose identity was later on based on, on uh, let's say, uh, genocide and the victimhood, which is also not a, not a really great thing to do, but uh, that's that's how uh, post-genocide societies uh, usually function. The the issue with post-war identity, post uh, post-war identity, is that um, the the best possible option would be to establish a Bosnian Herzegovinian identity as 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 one, which would cover I mean, as an umbrella. Of, all the ethnic groups there, just like you know Yugoslavia was. However, this is such a far-fetched idea, which currently has such a small number of followers because the educational system in Bosnia is divided. So uh, a Serb kid in Prijedor learns the same from the same history and geography book as the kid in Niš. The education is the same. The Croat kid in in, in Vitez learns the same. Text, uh, history and geography textbook as the kid in Karlovac. So basically what we have is we have uh, uh, Croat, Serbs and Bosniaks in, in Bosnia today learning from different textbooks. And basically this kid who grows up in Prijedor, he doesn't grow up, and this is the last 20 years, 20, 30 years, he doesn't grow up thinking and knowing that his country is Bosnia, rather that, you know, that the Sava and the, uh, the Sava River and how many mountains there are and how many tourists visit Kopaunik every year and so on. These are the things he learns. So, so this was an intentionally done uh, pro uh, project by, by, by the neighboring countries in order to destroy the, the identity of Bosnia and Herzegovina itself. So 
this is the key issue right now that we have, and especially with 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 the very uh, complicated constitution and the and the electoral system. Uh, we have the issue that uh, the only people who can be elected in in offices are Bosniaks, Bosnian Serbs, and Bosnian Croats. So if you're a Jew, a Roma, if you consider yourself to be an Eskimo or whatever, you you cannot be elected at all. Even though there is an a uh, European Court decision from, I think, 2007, which hasn't been implemented at all uh, in the country because uh, the, the political parties in Bosnia cannot agree uh, upon it, and the EU and the, the West don't want to, uh, you know, wake up the sleeping uh, tiger, so we're just having a status quo currently in the region. So identity is a very important issue in the country today, and wherever you, you in a state institution, for example, you always, if you have a director who is a Bosniak, his deputies need to be a Serbian Akrat. Even though if he's a really lousy Bosniak, he still has to be the director because that's what belongs to that political party. So people are not employed according to merit, but according to their identity. Dennis, um I know you're also watching the region quite closely when it comes to what is happening politically. You're also writing, you're studying political science. And we also know and, and know quite well that uh, especially political representation, if you may say so, is also using these uh, identities and, and, and also these feelings of people to instrumentalize for their own political purposes. I mean, what would you say to this? Do you think that's, that's a, a fair asset? Or what do you think, like, how does all these things also reflect in, in politics within within the, the region from your point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, before I go into that, if I may just one Please add, feel free add, to, add one to more add thing a, to yeah. EU integration, for example. I mean, if you visit uh, Belgrade right now or, or Banja Luka, you get the feeling that... Um, you, if, no, if, if you watch the news, you get the feeling that nobody wants to join the re European Union right now. You get the, I mean, the latest polls was like uh, um, 30 only 30% in Serbia being... Um, for EU, EU integration and, you know, Vucic is portrayed as the hero if he comes back from a trip to Brussels and tells them how he stood up against the, the big bad guys from the European Commission or from the European Parliament. But when you talk to the young people, or at least the feeling I got, the most young people I talk to are saying, you know, this is the only alternative they have. And, uh, and I think that's the problem when you have uh, one guy in the country who is editor-in-chief for almost all the newspapers there are and can paint, you know, uh, the picture that he wants, that, you know, they're so close to Russia and so close to China. But uh, go down there and ask them what country they will go to for university or for an exchange semester. Nobody's going to go to... Uh, to uh, St. Petersburg or Moscow, they're going to go to Berlin or London, you know? And uh, your question, I'm sorry, about the instrumentalization of... Um, that political um, figures uh, are using this nationalism for their own political purposes in the region. I mean, how would you say that? Or what is their, wh what is their drive? What well, are they doing? It works. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the reason they do it. Uh, I would also say that's the reason that... Uh, FPÖ right now is being going more and more to the right and all the other parties are trying to catch up to them uh, because it, it works. That's, um, they see, okay, that's how we, how we have won the election, how we're winning the election and uh, we'll keep doing what we've been doing. Maybe you can, uh, as a journalist and as a person dealing with media, I mean, uh, maybe you can let us know a, b a bit about what you think is the role of media in, 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 in all these senses. I mean, we know that there is a, a big problem when it comes to the freedom of media, especially in Serbia, but not only in Serbia. And it is different, obviously, within the European Union, but I'm pretty sure you have been covering this as well, or at least seeing what is happening. And what would you say and why is it so important that we do have like uh, free media and how is this even working out? Also maybe related a little bit to what we talked before about memory and education. I mean, what is the role of media and how important is it actually in this context? Well, I think the freedom of media is one of the pillars of democracy yeah, and of a free society. But I must also <laughs> confess that it is becoming more and more difficult. Um, even in Austria, well, I know some media from the Balkans who are totally dependent and totally, uh, yeah, but they, they live with the, 
with um, the will of the politicians. And in Serbia, there are very little free media. The same is in, in Albania. No, Albania is not so bad. But Kosovo is everywhere. The politicians are really squeezing the media. And it's, it's not... Well, and, and also in Austria, it's, it's more and more political influence. It's... Um, yeah, I don't want to mention the papers or the you, the, the, the the ORF. It's it's everywhere. You can feel the pressure, but um, see what happens if 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 right wing politicians or politic po or populist politicians what if they gain power, what happens? The first thing they start is to squeeze the media, and the second is the justice system. And then it's really becoming dangerous. Huh? And if you look at Hungary, where you have literally all media uh, on the side of Orban and, and the justice system, it's, 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 it's impossible to get rid of him anymore. And uh, well, this is the really first thing is to keep the media to media free and without influence. But, but the other thing is that the populist parties have started to, to work with their own media with their own social medias, with their own TV channels, look at the FPÖ has their own FP channels, and they don't give interviews to to the normal, to the established media. So they have now their parallel world, and they are gaining power and more more power. I have a follow up question, a little bit not only on media, but since you're also dealing with foreign policy in Austria right now. And Austria used to be like the big friend of the Western Balkans. I mean, we know that um, it's very close to us. We had very good diplomats there. Um, huge diaspora, I already mentioned it. And uh, also just recently, I think a couple of days ago, uh, Mr. Schallenberg, Austrian foreign minister and, and uh, state secretary for European Union, uh, Caroline Edstadler, delivered a, a non-paper to, to Brussels um, where they were actually striving for, like talking about that the, um, Europe, the integration of the Western Balkans should be accelerated, we need a credible path until 24, uh, even making some suggestions which I think um, um, might, might even make sense, you know, in, in taking part, for example, at council, informal council meetings as Ukraine is doing already. Um, how do you see like the Austrian foreign policy when it comes to this? Because I very often have the feeling it's quite loud, outspoken at one time, but then again, I don't really see the action when it comes also broadly than to the European level. We still have five European Union countries not recognizing Kosovo, which is, uh, I would say, like one of the big problems when it comes to fostering integration for the whole region. You cannot leave Kosovo out, and still there is no visa liberalization. So Austrian foreign policy, in, 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 from your point of view, in, in this whole context of being part of the European Union. Well, one has to be fair. It's really true that the Austrian politicians are really working on the Western Balkans. They are really, they try to accelerate and they are pushing. But it, if you want to have success in Brussels, you have to push and push and push and push and for years and years and years. And until now, as I, as I said before, uh, nobody was interested in, in, keep, in taking the southeastern countries into the European Union, which has changed after the Ukraine war. But this idea from... Mr. Schallenberg and Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Edstadler is, is not new, it's, it's about one year old. And the idea is not bad. The idea is to, because usually it takes, I think, 20 years until a new, new country gets into the European Union. And we cannot wait another 20 years. And the idea would be to take in the countries on different levels of cooperation. And that could work, for example, on, on traffic systems or an or electricity grid or the, the, the horizon program. And that would make sense because um, it would, it would, uh, the people in the Balkans would feel some kind of success or cooperation. If I can, I just have one question because I think that there was a panel with the Ocean Society for European politics on, on this topic just recently and uh, but what about the other side uh, the European Union itself I mean there are reforms that still have to happen inside the Union do you think this is something that can happen simultaneously so the Western Balkans reforming just the stage accession joining the Union integrating and then the EU also reforming yeah, this has to happen at the same time. And actually, today, not tomorrow, there is a summit in Granada where the, the, the heads of state will have to think how we will reform the, the, the complete European Union because otherwise the EU cannot take in nine countries. 
cannot even take three countries without reforming. Huh? It's, it's, it's getting too big, too bureaucratic, too, too sophisticated. We, do, we just have to simplify and to get things done more easily. And you have to solve the question of the money. And, and all this has to happen at the same time. The, 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 the countries have to approach to the European Union and the European Union has to reform with, from within. Yes, please. If I can just add one, one thing. Um, apart from, from EU integration, what I always like to, to emphasize is NATO integration. And NATO integration of uh, Bosnia and Serbia or just Bosnia would drastically change the, the power level in the Balkans. Because currently Serbia is uh, mingling in the affairs of Montenegro, Bosnia, Kosovo and Macedonia. These are, these are three regions which are uh, very close to each other, which have a lot of personal family connections across borders. And we know very well the history of the Balkans. If something sparks in, in Macedonia, it, it can very quickly spread over uh, throughout the region. Uh, by getting Bosnia into NATO, we would change this entirely. Uh, the other thing is that uh, e EU policy towards the Balkans sometimes also fosters far-right uh, extremism. For example, Macedonia did the one thing nobody else had to do. They changed their name, the country name. And once they didn't get what they what they were promised, then the the the, the nationalists in Bosnia uh, said, "Well, look, you know, I mean, the, the EU, um, um, uh, you know, they didn't fulfill the, their promise towards Macedonia. Why do you believe uh, they're going to fulfill it here? Let's move towards China, Russia, and so." And this is, wasn't even this was even said by some Bosniak nationalist politicians, which was very shocking because they're always. Uh, pro-EU, pro-NATO. So uh, the EU policy towards the Balkans needs to be more, uh, more smarter, more concise, and and uh, it only takes one, basically one decision currently to put Bosnia in NATO, and you will deal, because Bosnia is the one key country, which which can very quickly split up uh, uh, in the moment, and we have a large Russian influence in Bosnia. I remember ten years ago when we were talking about Russian mingling in in Bosnia. EU uh, analysts and I mean uh, uh, Western analysts told us you know Russia is poor they don't have money their their GDP is this and that but Russia always plays the 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 low cost conflicts you know they don't need money to come to Bosnia they have Nura Dodik um, and 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 the Bosnian Serb Republic which only needs 40 50 night wolves to to start a small war and uh, you know stir up the whole Balkan wars again so. Uh, this, is, this is the thing with the EU. They need to have a much more concise uh, effort towards, uh, towards the region, especially these two, three countries. Yes, I think that's one of the topics we are discussing since many years also. How credible can the European Union still be with all these, what happened with Albania, North Macedonia, and France, and the Netherlands, you know, by and now. Um, I have added, um, another question which is uh, related to the European Union and uh, reconciliation. Because we know that reconciliation is a very difficult topic and I remember I was there with my colleague in, in the region, I don't know, like two years ago and we asked everyone, like every person we met in Bosnia and Herzegovina, what about reconciliation? And everyone answered, it's very important, but... And so the question is, you know, I had the feeling that many people are like, yeah, we don't really want to talk about it right now. We think it's as an important thing, but once you are in the European Union, the issue will resolve by itself. So how would you say, like, what is uh, the question about reconciliation? What is, why is it so difficult to talk about it? Um, the number one thing about reconciliation is that it cannot happen overnight. Uh, that's one thing. Second thing is that it, it, uh, the situation, the crimes which were committed in Bosnia uh, was so personalized that um, reconciliation on that local level is basically, in most cases, impossible because communities which were kicked out don't live there anymore. So it's difficult to reconciliate a Serb from Priedor and a Bosniak from Hamilton in, in Toronto because they live across the, 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 the other side of the world. Um, when we talk about inter-ethnic relations in Bosnia, I would say that it's much better than, than, than people from the outside maybe might view it. You can have very good relations with people uh, 
you know, gas is cheaper in, in, in eastern Sarajevo. Uh, when, and that's like half an hour from my home. So you can go there and change your tires and buy gas and so on and you know, go to the um, pharmacy and buy cheaper stuff there. So, uh, and the relations there are very good, actually. You know, people cooperate, uh, big businesses, big corporations function very well. You have uh, Sir, Sir Bosnian Serb bakeries opening up in, in mid Sarajevo, in Bashjarshia, in the old town. And you have big Bosnian businesses like Bingo opening up in, in Banja Luka. So economically wise, things are, you know, much better than people would seem. And I often joke that uh, the situation in Bosnia is much better than in Northern Ireland because uh, I always thought that Bosnia was bad, but when I saw the situation in Northern Ireland, I was really shocked. Um, the only problem that we have in Bosnia are politics and media. And of course, we mentioned media as, 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 as something which is state-controlled. Now we have a new media which might not even be uh, state-controlled, and that is social media, where you can have one influencer who's able to 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 uh, spread hate uh, very quickly uh, throughout throughout the media and uh, you know disrupt reconciliation efforts uh, and to target people who are working on 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 exposing the truth about about what happened 30 years ago we uh, two days three days ago just before I arrived to Vienna we had a huge conference in Sarajevo about the internet governance uh, conference because hate speech in Bosnia is currently on the rise. Uh, cyber uh, uh, cyber crime. Uh, this is something which is supported and fostered by 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 uh, criminal groups and and uh, by by regimes in the region and by malig foreign influences. So uh, there, there's a new media which needs to be somehow controlled, and it's difficult to control it in a country where, where you know, you can't agree on, on, on basic, uh, you know, like the import, import of water and so on. So, so um, this is one of the key issues in, in the reconciliation efforts. And when we talk about um, the EU, they, they, they threw a lot of money into Bosnia on reconciliation efforts. But the way how they wanted to reconcile people in Bosnia was very naive they would they would bring like 30 young kids to a mountain and and and, and to a mountain Bielashnitsa Yahrina have them play games and so on and after two days they would say well it was a successful workshop that's not how reconciliation works uh, we all you know have a very good time and uh, everybody can drink a beer or, or smoke a nargila and so on but if you mention the war, that's when uh, the debate gets, gets more heated. So that's the one, number one thing that the EU usually um, missed out on. Secondly, they also have they had very uh, naive um, and 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 misrepresented uh, um, projects. For example, they they reconstructed the partisan hall in Focha, which was a rape camp during the war. So if you go there today, you'll see a, a big white table saying this project, the reconstruction of this building was supported by the EU, the, the flag of the EU. So you have a, and, and of course in this building you don't have a single memorial. Because the local community would say, you know, you need to rebuild this building, they would come throw money at it, uh, the survivors don't live in Focha anymore, so they rebuild this building and you know, if you keep it quiet, if nobody knows about it, then you can, you know, things can, can, can pass through very, very easily. But of course this is something which, which hurts the, the survivors and the, the people who were, who were kicked out of, of Focha. But this is something which the EU does. I mean, they, are, uh, they, they, they do good things, but then they, they, they produce a lot of milk, but then they, they, they kick the, the bucket and the milk is spilled. You know? so, so this is one of the things which... which, uh, which uh, I mean, they're trying to be politically correct in a post-genocide society. Let's put it like that. In a post-genocide society, you cannot be politically correct. You cannot say all sides are equal. You cannot say, you know, we call on, on all sides to refrain from, from uh, glorification and so on. I mean, you have murals in one town, you, you go there and I, when I talk to them, they always ask what can be done. I tell them very easily, don't give a single euro to, 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 an, to a municipality which has murals of war criminals there. Don't give a single euro to Focha because Focha has 18 murals of war criminals in their city. So 18 murals, large murals of war criminals, and you give them money to rebuild, uh, you know, the municipality building, the hospital. Don't give them a sing single euro, put, the, put them on sanctions until they deal with the past. Very easy, you know. Uh, just like they, deal, they dealt with other, uh, other issues uh, uh, 
um, throughout throughout the year. So that's that's my that's my position on on this question. Thank you. My last question before we go to the audience, uh, I will pose it to all of you: is like, what can we do? I mean, what should be done? I mean, maybe from the European Union level, you already mentioned like one point, but I mean, obviously, the European Union cannot change like the mindset of all the people living in there. So there also needs to be some effort coming from within. And uh, in general, like, what can we do? What should be done in order to overcome like this cycle of radicalization, nationalism, which ultimately may lead, hopefully, not to genocide, but still, you know, like to violent outbreaks and to hatred. What we just recently saw again in the north of Kosovo, it, it's it's very fragile. So, what can we do to reverse the trend? I mean, Dennis, what would you? What would be your first ideas on how can we get out of this? Maybe b because we talked about reconciliation. Yeah. Uh, what, what and also what can be done? I think uh, a lot of people have uh, have misunderstood or need to rethink their definition of what reconciliation means. It is not what he just said: go and take a, a Serb and a Bosniak and let them play chess or soccer for for an hour. But I think it is it is the most effective way to work uh, towards reconciliation is uh, about distributing the facts about what happened and not in. Uh, in a, in a populist way, or with speeches or whatever, but with you know books, who are uh, that have sources, you know, credible sources from the ICTY or established sources, and I think it's about a lot of uh, uncomfortable conversations. And I think still we're gonna have to have this conversation here in Austria as well, because you know when when I go to a school in the 21st district or in the 10th district, and I talk to them about my work at the Memorial Center or the war in Bosnia, the Yugoslav wars, uh, I see I see 10 kids or 10 kids come up to me and say, you know, they have never heard about this and uh, they had no clue, And but that, you know, their parents told them a whole, a whole different story. So I think there's gonna be a, um, a lot of uncomfortable discussions and conversations in the future and a lot of efforts that still need to be made. What do you think? What could be the way out of uh, reversing the trends of radicalization, nationalism, and getting out of this uh, mainstreaming of radical ideas, which, as I just mentioned in the beginning, we didn't talk about it too much, but it is also happening within European Union countries. Uh, it is happening uh, when you go to demonstrations, uh, anti-vaccines, anti- or climate skepticism, uh, you name it. When it, when we look at the US, uh, when we had like the Black Lives Matters and then the White Lives Matters came out. So all these mainstreaming of very radical ideas. I mean, how do we counter this in order to come back or at least to support a resilient democracy, which we are actually kind of used to be proud of uh, within the European Union? Difficult question, well, just for some ideas. I know you're not going to if, have if the I recipe, knew, but... If I knew the way out, I would be the luckiest person of the world. <laughs> but I only know that um, reconciliation that starts with the question is what have I done and what is my responsibility? And that's where all the process stops. Because no, neither in Serbia, nor in Bosnia, nor in uh, Croatia, nor in uh, Albania, nor in Kosovo, there are these real questions, what was my responsibility, what was my crime? And as the others don't start, you don't start yourself. And so it, it, it never starts. And, and there, is no, there is no, I don't know whether, yeah, maybe there's the Helsinki Federation in, 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 in Belgrade who, who wants to, 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 to initiate this, but it is just a little minority, and they are not, and they have their problems even to survive in Belgrade. Yeah, so there is no, there is no wish from above to start this discussion, to start thinking about their own uh, responsibility, and, and on the contrary, we've seen the thing that happened in in northern Kosovo a few days ago, the guys who attacked uh, the, the the banya, the the, the, the monastery, and. They came back to Belgia, to, to to Belgrade, and in the media they were they were celebrated as heroes. They are never. They see everybody sees themselves as victims, and of course there are victims. But but if if you don't start to think yourself, then there will be no reconciliation. Or you can do it like in Rwanda when you have another dictatorship who says, "Okay, we are not Hutu and you are not uh, the other one anymore. We are now Rwandese and we don't talk about it anymore." Okay, but I don't know whether this is reconciliation. Can I just add something? And I think the, the the biggest issue on why these people were allowed to be seen as heroes is because the West is trying to appease Vucic. 
Imagine if the situation was the other way around. Imagine if you had 30 Albanians coming into Preševo, fully armed. What would have happened? I, 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 I would believe that you would be having drones right now above Kosovo, bombarding these uh, training centers and so on. But here we had the whole day, 24 hours, there was no news about this. Uh, everybody was ignoring it as if it didn't happen. And uh, uh, I personally think that Vucic didn't know about it. I think it was uh, the work of uh, one of his ministers and people from the, from the military. But nevertheless, you have people in, in, in the hospitals being treated. You had the media writing about it. And I'm just thinking, imagine if it was the other way around. It would be an entirely different story. And the problem with, with the appeasement issues is that it never works. It didn't work with Hitler. It won't work with, it didn't work with Milosevic. It won't work with anybody else. Appeasing dictators never works. You need to stop it when it's in the early phase. And still, how do we get out of uh, this circle of nationalism? What can be done? What can be done otherwise? To get to, a, to get to a more resilient society, which is also able, you know, to, to see what is fake news, what is, um, how can we get our own opinion, how do we not fall into these tracks of polarization, which uh, is used. I mean, it's a very difficult question, I know, but maybe some ideas on it. Look, we are always going to have issues with far-right nationalism, with, with religious radicalization and so on. It's always going to be there. I mean, in the 1970s, you had leftist terrorism, which, you know, was was all all over the, the 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 globe and so on. It stopped at one point. Then you had the far right, and you had Muslim radicalization, uh, Al Qaeda, and everything else. So maybe in twenty years time, you're going to have some other sort of radicalization. But it's some, something is always going to be there. The most important thing is, as Ingrid mentioned earlier, is to have strong state institutions: the the the, the military, the police, the judicial system, the media. If you have the biggest problem you're going to have is once far right groups and members enter the state institutions. Once they get their control of the budget, once they get the control of decision-making centers, that's when you're gonna have a huge problem. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's why I'm always happy to see that, you know, a certain far-right members have been arrested in, inside the, the German military or um, far-right members in the US Army and so on, because it shows that there is some sort of uh, uh, check and balances within these institutions which exist, which monitor. You need to be very efficient in, 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 in sanctioning these kind of activities. And I mean, uh, these people have no place in these kind of institutions. So the police, the military, the judicial system, and the media is something which needs to be free and, and, and supported by the state. Thank you very much. Great. Um, we can, I already see one, two, three. Maybe we start here, Luca. Um, if, you would, if, if it is a specific question, please uh, let us know to whom it is, and maybe uh, you can give very uh, briefly just introduce yourself. Should I introduce first to myself? Yes. Should exactly. I stand up? Yes, please. Why not? Okay. So, hello, everybody. My name is Mark Bissera. I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I come from Sarajevo. But I study now at Diplomatic Academy in Vienna, at the diploma program. And this question is actually aimed, dedicated to journalist Mrs. Ingrid. Uh, at one, when you were talking, you were saying that Western Balkans are actually s some time behind the Western Europe. And actually, I got a bit offended with that. So I would just like to ask you, uh, why do you think that, okay, I know we have problems in our region, and I feel really ashamed of our politicians, just I wanted to ask you, why do you think that we are behind others? And how do you actually perceive a Balkan diaspora living in, I don't know, Austria? Are you from Brussels, right? No, I'm yeah. Austrian. Yeah, how do I'm you perceive Austrian. Balkan diaspora living here? Thank you. Um, it, it, it was not my <laughs> opinion. <laughs> and that's, not, that's what I realized when I came to Brussels. That's what I felt, that in Brussels, and in this, in this political machine there, the Western Balkans are felt very far away. And that's, this, I have no opinion, opinion uh, it's, it's a bad idea, yeah? but it's how it is. Yeah? But it's not my opinion. Then we had you over here? Yes. And then there in the back? So, uh, my name is Jun Saito. I am a, a doctoral student at the University of Vienna and I'm writing about Austrian security policy on the Western Balkans. 
So at what time, uh, one question uh, for you, Ingrid. So, so my question is Austrian influence on the decision making in the European Union. And uh, do you believe probably uh, Aust uh, uh, probably uh, Austria are linked to issues so uh, accession process of Western Balkans and accession process of Ukraine uh, like the, it is similar with the linkage between uh, negotiation with Turkey and Croatia in year 2001 and the Austria said okay uh, uh, if the European Union uh, push the process with Western Balkans and then Austria agreed with the, for example, the, even the beginning of negotiation uh, uh, with Ukraine. And the second question is for you. So uh, you mentioned some linkage with uh, uh, Western Balkans or Russia, and you, and you said, so no more appeasement to uh, authoritarian or uh, dict uh, dictators. And, and of course, so we know the war in Ukraine and the instability in uh, instability in Western Balkan uh, linked with each other, so that's why. Uh, how do you or how do the Bosnian society or Bosnian government, uh, the war, uh, war in Ukraine or the politics about war in Ukraine? Thank you very much. You first. Okay. If the, the war in Ukraine, if it didn't if the Ukrainians didn't defend themselves, if Ukraine fell in, in after the 24th of February, uh, you would have had a war in Bosnia. The situation was so polarized in Bosnia, the, 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 the amount of um, agents uh, distributing weapons and, and preparing themselves um, on all sides was really high. The one thing I can say as a Bosnian is uh, Slava Ukraina, and uh, we need to arm U the Ukrainians because the Ukrainians are the ones defending democracy in Europe. If Ukraine st uh, stops, if Ukraine falls, uh, Poland will be next, Bosnia will be next, Montenegro will be next, and the, the next thing you know, you're going to have the, the Russian Navy in Montenegro. And then the Europeans will be saying, how did this come to this, you know. Once the Russians are 10 kilometers from, from Italy, then they will be shocked. So uh, if you don't want to have a war in your garden, you need to send good weapons to Ukraine, not to send them helmets, but good weapons. And uh, do the Ukrainians have motivation to fight and to defend themselves? If you appease Putin, he's not gonna stop there. He's not gonna stop in Ukraine, he's gonna move on forward. And the only countries which realize these things are the countries which live in the Soviet Union, who know what the Russian uh, influence is. And uh, the recent elections in Slovakia, very bad news. Uh, Viktor Orban's, uh, the appeasement of Viktor Orban, very bad news. The EU gave, I read this yesterday, 13 million euros to Viktor Orban so that he doesn't stop, so that he doesn't veto EU uh, aid to Ukraine. So imagine what is happening right now. The EU is giving money to Orban. Orban is taking part of that money, giving it to Dodik in Bosnia, because he gives like 200,000 euros to Milo Dodik's personal party. So EU is indirectly funding Dodik, and then we are having talks with the EU delegation, on, and then the EU is write, write, writing press releases telling Dodik not to, you know, to behave and things like this. So uh, to, to make this answer shorter than, than it should be, uh, arm Ukraine, send them weapons, uh, let them defeat uh, the, the Russian separatists in Ukraine. Uh, this, will, this will end Putin's rule, and uh, then you're going to have peace. Ingrid, the question about Austria's influence in decision making in the European Union. Um, well, I didn't get the connection to, to Turkey. Was your question about? So, okay, uh, my question is uh, on those dates. So, on, uh, in October two thousand five, at first, uh, Austria uh, threatened with a veto against the negotiation with Turkey in order to uh, realize the negotiation with uh, Croatia. 
And this is uh, the story of Onzo Sei. In this is October in 2005, uh, represented by the foreign, mini uh, foreign minister uh, Ursula Prasnik, but sure, this is a uh, ordered by Wolfgang Schussel, and the cover page of Croatia magazine is the portrait of Schussel, and then in German, Dankeschön. Mm -hmm. And then my question is, uh, on also this, uh, in this year, and then probably uh, the Austria could host it, the issue of EU enlargement to Ukraine uh, to uh, realize or to, to realize the uh, to realize the uh, uh, positive development of the negotiation with uh, Western Balkans. So this is my question. Well, I think um, Austria is really always, has always been the, the, the lawyer of the Western Balkans in Brussels. Yeah? Austria is not that influential. Austria is small and Austria is not really good in finding allies. And that's, a pro that's our problem. Um, from now on, well, some, we found an ally in Germany. They are now also more approaching to the Western Balkan countries, but it took a long time. Huh? And well, was what with Turkey? You know, there are. I think it's really historic reasons why Austria is so kept skeptical with the Turkey. It's I, I cannot find another reason. And of course, Turkey is too big to get in. Turkey is too powerful and. Yeah, I don't know, maybe because it's a Muslim country also. That's also one reason why it's difficult, huh? or why, why Europe sees it difficult. But first of all, it's too big. Yeah. And I don't know, Austria was one of the few countries who said, well, who said publicly no. And Austria was also the country who said no, we should totally stop the negoti negotiations with, with Turkey after the, after the coup of 2016. Whereas all the other countries said, mm, okay, let's freeze it and we don't just don't talk anymore. But Austria said, was the one country who said no. And well, we got some problems from Turkey. There in the back and then in the front, Luca. Thank you. My name is Kamal, I'm a researcher. So what is the nature of this nationalism in the countries of former Yugoslavia? This could, could not be ethnically because ethnically, linguistically, they are very similar. Is it religious, Muslim, Christian, Orthodox, Catholic, and so on? Thank you. I think that's for you, Hikmet. Sorry, where are you from? From Kurdistan, I'm a Kurdish. Kurdistan, okay. Um, in, in the former Yugoslavia, ethnic identity is related to religious identity. So Croat, Catholic, Serb, Orthodox, Christian, uh, Bosniak, Muslim, and so on. So very rare cases of having a Croat, Orthodox, Christian, or a Serb, Catholic, uh, and so on. So, so that, that's, that's the main reason uh, for, 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 uh, for this. It's not like in, 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 uh, in other areas where you have you know, uh, a mix of one identity and different religions. This is basically one, one next to the other. But, but sorry to, to interrupt. In, in with the Albanian society, it's different because you have in, uh, in you have Christians, you have Muslims, you have Orthodox Christians, and the Albanians f feel their identity by being Albanian and not by having any religion. Yeah, the, the difference is that in, in the former Yugoslavia, we're, we're talking about, I'm, I was referring to the Slavic nations, and the difference with the Albanians is that uh, the language is the main barrier there. I mean, there are virtually no no similarities, and, and the Albanians don't consider themselves Slavic right there, Illyrians. So here, I mean, we have more similarities between, Bosniaks have more similarities with Serbs than they have with Turks, in the sense of language, tradition, and so on and so forth. And then the religion is, I mean, so the only difference, I mean, firstly, racially, you can't define anybody when you see them in the streets. Uh, we all eat the same baklava and the sarma and everything else. The only difference is that Bosniaks don't eat pork and most of the Bosniaks don't drink alcohol, but many do, so it's a bit uh, not so complicated, but again, more similarities than differences, which makes it much more uh, um, confusing and, and, and uh, Difficult to understand, and why so many brutal crimes, and we are so similar to each other, you know. But maybe that's a discussion for another uh, time. Front, Luca. 
My name is Kabir Sokulu. I'm the chairman of um, this association that is so difficult to pronounce. <laughs> we maybe should change the name. I'll just say the Bosnian Austrian Youth. It's a bit shorter. Um, first and foremost, thank you for uh, having us here today. We are very happy as the co-organizer to be able to host Hikmet and uh, Ms. Uh, Imgrid uh, here. And um, I have a, a couple of things I just wanted to, to mention and then a, a question to, to Dr. Hikmet. I mean, just a quick reference to um, the gentleman who, who just asked about the religious differences. Yeah. I mean, I think it's very important to mention uh, the time before uh, the Yugoslav era, yeah, when um, all people in Bosnia were considered Bosniaks. Let's remember Austria-Hungary, when taking over Bosnia, um, defined all people as Bosniaks. If you go today into Sarajevo uh, Catholic Cathedral and you look at the windows and uh, at the windows, at the ornaments there, uh, what it says there, it says it's it's built by the Catholic Bosniaks. Yeah. So I just want to mention we had a time when all people in Bosnia considered as uh, one ethnicity. And we have to understand for Bosnia and the Balkans the power of um, church propaganda, basically, yeah, from both sides, from the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. So I think this, this adds to the dimension here. And uh, the second thing I want to mention is about the reconciliation. We, we, are, we are thinking of how to reconciliate, right? And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I think I have to disagree with all uh, the guests and, and uh, with all the statements. I think these are all secondary or, 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 or things that count third or, or on the fourth place. I think it's a power game, basically. Yeah. And it's easy to say we'll educate the people, but education can never start when we have this political system, when we have those politicians in place. We cannot just say we'll just change the politicians because we did. There were such examples, but the new ones came. So I think we have to recognize that the problem is the polit uh, political system in Bosnia. Yeah? Because we cannot just say, okay, let's stop being extremist and nationalist, when the political system is aimed for nationalism. Hikmet was very clear about this, saying that you have to be a Bosniak, a Serb, or a Croat to be elected. So we have parties, we have the political system just aiming for this. So everything you hear from, from day in and day out is nationalism. And we're not going to get out there. It's only going to be worse. And this nationalism is going to take a stance in school and in every other part of the, of, 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 of the society. So I think it's very important to, to recognize and it's also unrealistic to expect Bosnia and the Bosnian people to solve this problem by themselves. I mean, we had Petric um, as the um, high representative saying um, Zwangsjacke for the Dayton agreements or Straterjacke, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, and the UN as the guarantor of this um, um, Dayton agreement has to, to step in and change this and, and actually see that it's, it's, it's failed and, and, and um, see that um, there was one party that profited from ethnic cleansing and killing and humiliating what, what Hikmet is writing in his book about. And we are not, as a society, as a human society, we shouldn't be in this posi posi position to, to um, allow those people to win and succeed with their tactics. Yeah. So uh, basically, I think this is the most important thing. And now to the question for you, Hikmet. I'm sorry for taking the time, but I think um, it, 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 it was in my heart. I would just want to tell it. Um, the question to you is, isn't it now um, the best time to actually solve the Bosnian problem on the Balkans when Russia is uh, engaged in, in, in Ukraine and cannot much intervene on the Balkans um, and, and actually recognize as the EU that this is um, a EU problem, basically, because we're always talking about 
that the Western Balkan states are profiting from, from coming into EU, but actually EU is also profiting uh, uh, from this. Yeah. So this would be my question. Um, the, the problems in Bosnia were always viewed as internal problems of Bosnia. Uh, what I always like to say is that the problems in Bosnia represent currently a security threat to the region. And that's something which we need to focus on. So we need to view the, the events in Bosnia as a security threat to the region. Uh, integrating and solving the, the issue of, of Bosnia uh, can, be done, can be done very quickly. Uh, and it won't take up much effort for, it won't be a huge problem, even demographically or economically for, for the EU, since um, that's integrating you know, two and a half million, two million people uh, maybe two and a half million people living there because the amount of Bosnians coming to the EU is already uh, large and, and Bosnia is being slowly empty day, day, day by day. And everybody, everybody is going um, to the EU. So, and there, there, there's an interesting case in which uh, uh, Serbs and uh, Bosnian Serbs, Bosniaks and Bosnian Croats together learn German, so that they can come and work in Germany and, and, and Austria, and then on Facebook they fight over who's right. So uh, uh, integrating Bosnia in the EU and in NATO would solve the issues of, of, uh, of the region, and this is something which can be done very, very quickly. Even if you don't change the internal uh, uh, um, administrative lines within Bosnia. So this is the one thing... Uh, if, 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 the, if the Bosnian Serbs are insisting on, on Republika Srpska to, to stay it is, and we know that you cannot change something which has been conquered in a war in a peaceful time. You cannot change it peacefully if it's, if it's conquered by a war, just like Nagorno-Karabakh, just like um, uh, Ukraine and so on. No peace talks, no United Nations can change the reality on the terrain. That's, that's the one thing we as Bosniaks need to come to terms with. Uh, so even if, it, if, it, if, if, if the Serb Republic, Bosnian Serb Republic stays within Bosnia, but if you integrate it into the EU and NATO, it virtually doesn't matter anymore, uh, you know, because it's all part of the EU. So, and this, this is going to be the same thing with Kosovo, with, with North Macedonia, with, uh, with Serbia, with Sanjak and so on. Um, in the end, it won't really matter in 20, 30 years' time because you know your kids won't know whether Focha was, you know, in the, in in the Bosnian Serb Republic or in Bosnia or just like we don't know whether uh, most of Bosnians don't know that Ujice one day was 150 years ago a Muslim majority town and so on. So people forget over time, but the 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 matter of the fact is what we need to do currently is uh, use this opportunity. And that's something which I agree with you use the, this opportunity while, while Russia is focused on, on, uh, on Ukraine uh, to solve the issue of Bosnia. The problem is we are currently having uh, two major, one major conflict and one conflict which will happen in the next couple of years and that is in Taiwan. Uh, and when that happens, then we are totally going to be off the radar. Then nobody's going to care about Bosnia in five years time. So if we don't solve the issue of Bosnia in the next couple of years, then we can all say goodbye to the region, and then we will all, we will all basically uh, move out slowly to, to Germany and Austria, and then you'll have Bosnia, Serbia, and Sanjak, and, and uh, Montenegro and Croatia empty, where we will go back over the summer for Chavapi and to, uh, and to make our teeth, uh, because the dentists there are more cheaper than in, than in Germany, and uh, maybe go hunting there, because there's more wildlife currently uh, in the region and so on. So maybe maybe this is the long-term plan of the EU to slowly demographically empty the region, integrate them into the EU, and then dissolve the issue of nationalism in, in the Balkans, which if it's, uh, this is a conspiracy theory right now, which I'm saying, but if that is true, then that is one of the best policies of the EU uh, um, which, which, which they're trying to do. But I, I, but believe me, once, once it breaks out in Taiwan, uh, in a few years' time, and, and definitely will, uh, then we are totally going to be off the radar. So if we don't solve it right now, uh, we won't solve it ever. 
just one in the back. Maybe if I just also may add something on the reconciliation thing, because I don't really think that uh, you agreed with um, the speakers here, because I also do think that reconciliation is a process without a beginning and an ending. It's a process which have, has very, very many different elements, and you start something there and something there. In, it's it's not going to end at one point, you know, but then we just had like several elements, I mean, discussing like what part of it could mean. So I don't really think it was like a huge disagreement, but yeah, sorry, there in the back, yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Erim Asan Akkalic. I'm from Documentation Center um, of Austrian Resistance. And I search on, um, I do my research on Turkish um, extremist movement in, in Austria. Uh, my question is about Turkey. Um, what do you think is the impact of Turkey on uh, extremist movements in this region? Very difficult question. I'm not an expert on this, but um, the the now it de depends how you define what are Turkish extremist groups. If you say the the grey wolves, right? Uh, there are. Uh, there was a report by the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network a couple of years ago about um, some some members being in the in the region and so on. But my honest opinion, I don't think they are they are that uh, present and that influential. That, that's my personal opinion. Again, I'm not an expert in it. I I I, I, um, I know what I read online and so on. But uh, uh, there is a larger influence of Turkey in the in the sense of. Uh, um, let's say, religious administrative influence in the sense that they were rebuilding uh, mosques and so on in the, in, the, in the region. But other than that, in a national sense, I don't believe that the Balkans are so interesting to, to Turkey. Even there are more Turkish businessmen in Belgrade than they are in Sarajevo. Turkey has invested more in Serbia than it has in, in, in Bosnia. Uh, even in, in Serbia, when they invest, they don't invest in Sanjak, they invest in Belgrade because business doesn't... Um, when you invest, you invest to get your money back, not to not to make it uh, disappear. So uh, I would say that that in that aspect, um, currently, as far as I know, we don't have such a large influence of them in the region. More questions? There is one. Um, I have a question because... Can you stand up because they cannot uh, see okay. you? I mean... Yeah. Um, what do you think needs to happen for Bosnia to have a own national identity? For example, Ukraine kind of needed this war to really unite. So we have the Hungarian minority, the Polish minority and so on. And what needs to happen in Bosnia for that? So in, in, in the best possible scenario, if we don't have the influence of Croatia and Serbia for the next 40 years, to a new generation of kids who are going to, uh, you know, learn Bosnian language, uh, learn no, I mean, even not language, history and geography, basically the two main topics, um, that would need need to happen. But currently, with with this uh, drain of population demographically, uh, I don't honestly, I'm I'm known for being a pessimist in in in. In, in Bosnia, but I don't believe that this is ever going to happen in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in one sense. Um, Kaber mentioned earlier about the Austro-Hungarian. Uh, the Austro-Hungarians tried to set up a, a, a one identity, which was uh, this was pushed by by an Austrian uh, governor called Benjamin Kalai, and this is the idea of Bosniaks being all Muslims and Croats, uh, Muslims and Orthodox and Catholics and so on. The the the, the two main institutions which were against this were the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church and the influence of Russia. Because having one Bosnian identity isn't something which uh, the neighboring countries want. Because if you have a, if you have a Bosni Bosnian uh, Catholic or a Bosnian Orthodox Christian, then you can't divide the country up, right? But uh, if you have a Serb in, in, in living in Banja Luka, uh, believing that Belgrade is his capital city, then you basically have a have two states then, um, and you basically have 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 him being closer to to Belgrade than he is to Sarajevo. So that's the intention of 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 of. of and this is something which has been going on for quite some time. It's not something that's just happening overnight. That's not something which happened uh, out of the blue. The only period when, when there was no interference to a large extent or at all was during the communist time. 
1945, 1990. So that's the only time when we didn't have such a large, uh, large uh, influence on on national identity. And this is actually, even though many, many, many maybe Bosniaks would find it difficult to hear, but Josip Broz Tito was the one actually, and the communist Yugoslavia was the one which was very, very, very beneficial to the to the affirmation of the. A Muslim or Bosniak identity in the region. So they're the ones actually who helped and supported the establishment of the of the Muslim Bosniak uh, um, or Muslim identity to counter the the nationalism of Croatia and Serbia. So if the communists couldn't deal with it and they dealt with issues very very well, I don't believe uh, we can do this uh, at this time. So. Yes, last question, but we still will have um, time afterwards to discuss with a glass of wine and water or whatever, so I'm pretty sure that Luca has one. <laughs> so actually we... Is it on? Yes, it is. So actually because we have talked a lot about our region and we have mentioned Serbs and Serbia and all, so I think it's maybe good also to give an opinion of a Serb in the room. Um, I think it's important to, to say that it's, it's, it's obligatory not to generalize. I don't say that the panel generalized, I think it was great. I just say for the region, for the people to know, there are also Serbs who are in favor of joining the European Union or also of joining NATO and so on and so on. We can discuss if it is good or not, this is another time. But what I wanted to say for Serbia, just so that maybe people can also a bit elaborate more, is Serbs have not dealt with their past in the last 30 years because the politicians didn't give them an opportunity. First, it was Croatian Krajina, then it was Republika Srpska, so those are two which went away. Then it was Kosovo war, which was abruptly ended by the bombardment of NATO of Serbia. We can also discuss if this was necessary or not, another part of the panel. And then in the end, it was Montenegro. So Montenegro, Srpska Krajina in Croatia, and the Republika Srpska are, are conflicts which are settled, let's say. Kosovo is not settled. Until Kosovo is not settled, nobody in Serbia from the politicians would try even to consider 1% of reconciling or pushing for reconciliation or pushing for anti-nationalistic rhetorics in our country. Why? Because Kosovo is the last burden that Serbia needs to, to deal with in a way it should choose carefully in the future in order to start with the reconciliation. The people may be started between themselves, I mean, me, Dennis, Flamur and other people, but when it comes to the state level and to the political level, then it's a completely other story. So I think that this is really important to mention. And another thing, the question actually for the panel, who remembers, who does not remember is also okay, but Milorad Dodik, <laughs> to mention also his name for the I don't know what time today, actually used to be a very pro-European, pro-Western uh, party of, 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 of the West. So he was a really good uh, connection for the Bosnian Serbs. This is actually how he he got uh, the the seat in the power, let's say, in Republika Srpska. What was the key moment in Dodik's political career, let's say it like this, that has shifted him from a pro-Western, pro-European guy to a nationalistic guy? So this is maybe a question for everybody of you who, who remember this time. So. Thank you. <laughs> I have a theory which, which many Bosniaks don't like to hear because everybody voted for him uh, back then, except for me and, and uh, my family. Uh, Haris Lajic in 2006. The elections in 2006, that's why I mentioned today 2000. 2006 was the, was the year things went downhill started to go downhill. Why? I remember this time very well. I was just finishing high school in 2006. Petty Ashdown left uh, Bosnia, the high represent representative, the one of, I mean, the best representative you had in Bosnia. He was, he was sacking everybody who, who didn't listen to him. And that's one of the things we need to have in Bosnia. We need to have former military guys or women who were a part of the SAS, who know how to deal with, with people from the Balkans uh, who don't listen. So Petty Ejdan left 2006. 2006 was the elections. Uh, Haris Lajic, who was the fo foreign prime minister, foreign minister during the war, uh, he had a split with Izzet in, in 1996. He, he went out of politics and then he, he had a major comeback in 2006. He came back and he's, Parole was 100% Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
he got his elections by stating that he is going to delete Dayton, that he is going to delete Republika Srpska. And being a populist as he is, everybody supported him. Because they said, wow, this is a guy who knows English, who, who, and he was presenting himself to people who have, who have as a man who has connections in the US, in Great Britain, and in the Arab world, that he's gonna you know, influence the United Nations to deal with this. Is that disagreement or no? <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, to 2006, he gets into power, he lasts for four years, and he's the, the counter guy who runs for elections that year is Miller Dodik. So Miller Dodik at that time, and up to then he was like quite okay. I mean, let's say, you know, Miller and Albright called him the, bre the breath of fresh air. And, you know, he was, even he was cooperating with people like the Social Democratic Party in Bosnia. He was coming to the conventions uh, in Sarajevo. And so he was, he was very often in Sarajevo, uh, very well recognized and so on. And in 2006, when, 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 when Slajic had this, uh, his party was called the party for Bosnia and Herzegovina, then Dodik's counter reaction was, we want secession, we want independence. Because if you're going to delete us, then we want to get out of Bosnia. What happens afterwards? After four years, the, of course, Slajic didn't manage to, to do anything, he was a populist. The Bosniaks get rid of him, they, they elect another leader, so he loses in a landslide. But Dodik wins again. So Dodik has been in power since 2006. And whether the Bosniaks like to uh, admit it or not, we are the ones actually who first started to uh, uh, try and, and not to respect the Dayton Peace Accords. Today we are all calling on the West to, to interfere with Dodik because he's not uh, respecting the Dayton Peace Accords. We are the ones who elected a leader who wanted to get rid of the Dayton Peace Accords. So I'm trying to be here, I'm not, I'm not going to be politically correct, I'm going to be honest, this is what happened. Bosniaks, major majority, voted for Haris Lajic in 2006, and Milora Dodik has been destroying the country since 2006, and he's doing it very well. He, he didn't have this power and this amount of control back in 2006. In 2006, he had some sort of uh, opposition in Bosnia. Today, you don't have an opposition in, in Republika Srpska. The media there is not free. He has his whole entire control on all the pores of, of life in Republika Srpska. So uh, my theory is that 2006 was the year when, when this happened. Thank you. I think it's time to end the discussion here, or do, does anyone... Uh, just no, say please. one more thing. I wanted uh, to ask if, or if yeah, any one of you want to Maybe not on, on Dodik. But uh, what completely escaped me today is, today is the 5th of October and on the right here, I know, I, I, I realized uh, the Milosevic regime fell uh, 23 years ago today. And, uh, you know, when we talk about Milorad Dodik and we talk about Vucic and uh, EU integration of Serbia and uh, we've been in Belgrade and, but I wonder, you know, if, if it will ever stop. And, you know, we, we say, for example, um, Dodik, you know, he was okay at first and, uh, then he turned nationalistic, uh, but if you you know look at Vucic, he he was always that way in in ninety nine as the minister, and then when he ran, uh, when he had his election, uh, you, you would see him hang up uh, or change a street sign and uh, try to change a, a street into you know Ulica Ratko Mladic, so the street of Ratko Mladic, and uh, you know all of all of this stuff. So I, um, what uh, I am thinking about, and I don't have the answer, maybe. Uh, one of you to do if uh, if it will ever stop and if it does, you know, uh, who is the guy or the woman that comes afterwards? And we had uh, Jinjic for a very brief time, unfortunately for a very brief time, but w what comes next, you know? Thank you, Dennis. We even organized an event on, on Zoran Jinjic uh, this year, so you can also rewatch it uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, do you want to add something still or? No. So let me thank you very much uh, for being here, for discussing with us. Um, it was an interesting dynamic, you know, like what we came then and to, especially also to what is happening in Bosnia Herzegovina when starting from genocide, radicalization, nationalism. Thank you very much for your expertise. Thank you so much for coming and uh, thank you very much to the Austrian, no, Bosnian Herzegovina and Austrian Society of Youth. 
and the Austrian Institute for International Politics and ÖHA uh, Wien. Um, we still invite you for a glass of wine or some water outside. You can still like talk to each other, ask Hikmet many, many more questions. I think he's still not done. And also ask Ingrid, ask Dennis. Thanks for coming. Have a nice evening. And also, uh, before Enjoy. you start clapping, there is a workshop tomorrow here at... Uh 5 p.m. where Hikmet uh, will talk about uh, right-wing symbols and narratives in the Western Balkans. So anyone who is interested can join. And, yeah. Yes, join the workshop. Thank you. <laughs>